Okay, I'm very sorry to interrupt your conversation. I hope that's a, a, a topic that you can return to and meet some of the other people on the table. Um, we're going to make sure that today is as full of conversation as possible, both in this room, but as I mentioned, with our online delegates as well. So a special favour for anyone who is here in the room. It's not that big of a room. The acoustics are pretty good. But can I ask everyone, if you're offering a thought or a question, um, to use one of the microphones that Izzy will be bringing around, and that way our online colleagues will be able to hear as well. Um, so even though if you're a brilliant projectionist, um, microphone, just so that we're inclusive. Think of yourselves as the exclusive studio, studio <laughs> audience rather than the full audience. So you need to be heard as well. Brilliant. So a very warm welcome to John Alexander, Ooh. who's our opening conversation <laughs> today. It's not your first communique. It isn't. I've been here before. Um, lots of you will know John from his work, his book, um, Citizens, I want to hold it up, but I've got it on Kindle, um, or the, new, the work of the new Citizenship Project. But if anyone here is not familiar, can you just tell us a little bit about you and the project and the book? Can I, can I dive off on one and tell mm. you my favourite story? Because that's, I, I always find this a lovely way to kind of land in a space, and I think that there's actually a load of stuff that's really relevant to this work uh, in this story, and, and I'll sort of use that to introduce myself. Mm. That's right. I'm going to rab it a Good. little bit. Uh, I get very overexcited. Uh, and by the way, yeah, communicate is a sort of coming home for me because my work isn't all in the nature sector. But I, uh, many years ago, I worked at the National Trust and I actually wrote Fiona Reynolds' speech for communicate about 15 years ago, which is like a kind of, so this is, this is joyful. Uh, so my favourite story from the research for the book is actually uh, the, the story of the transformation of the Taiwanese government over the last decade or so. So come with me on this journey, my friends. <laughs> uh, so it goes back to about 2012, and the, the government of Taiwan launched what they called the Economic Power Up Plan. And they said, uh, uh, there were TV commercials and all this sort of stuff that, that said, almost word for word, that said things like, don't let's waste time talking about uh, policies and complicated things like that. We'll get on with growing the economy, and you get on with your lives. It was a category of communication <laughs> I like to call, shush little people, just go shopping. Uh, and, and it seemed to go down okay to begin with, uh, but what was happening uh, was that a group of hackers originally started to organise, and they called themselves GovZero. And what they were doing was they were creating parallel websites to government websites, all with the URLs g0v.tw on the end, hence GovZero. And they said that they were forking the government, which is always quite fun to almost swear. And, uh, and on these websites, they made uh, it possible to upvote and downvote kind of budget items and comment on things. Uh, and they had downloadable conversation menus that you could discuss the work as a government at home and all this sort of stuff. And it wasn't massive, like it was a little bit geeky, let's be honest. Uh, but, it, but it started to grow, started to take hold. And two years on, uh, the government tried to rush through a trade bill with mainland China under the banner of the Economic Power Up Plan. And a protest kicked off in response to this, Occupy-style protest. They occupied the parliament. And the GovZero gang immediately got a broadband connection and started streaming uh, footage of what the protesters were doing all across the country. And what they were doing was they were using GovZero tools to discuss the clauses of the trade bill. Uh, and th at this point, the really, like, the pivotal moment came because the, the speaker of the parliament uh, came under pressure. He was, old guy, member of the establishment, kind of member of the governing party by kind of by affiliational. And he came under pressure to beat the protesters out and he didn't. Instead, he said, this is what this space is for. Like this, this is what we should be doing here. And he stood by the protesters and he promised that the trade bill would get due scrutiny. Uh, and so protesters left, trade bill got due scrutiny, trade bill got thrown out. Uh, within six months, there were municipal elections all over Taiwan and candidates were elected who sort of stood by the protesters and often from nowhere, like no speeches written kind of what me. Uh, and uh, in response to that, uh, one of the central government ministers invited one of the leaders of the hacker movement to become a mentor to them and started to bring the work. In. This is all totally true, by the way. Like you have to read the book for the evidence base, but I promise <laughs> you it's true. Uh, and uh, so this person became a mentor to a government minister, started to bring in some of the kind of crowdsourcing and so forth approaches into government. Two years on, power change, there was a presidential election, power changed hands, and that person became a minister in their own right. So it's like four-year career trajectory of hacker to mentor to minister, which is always quite fun uh, as well. And, 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 brought, and these, this became, started to become the ways of working. 
and then I'll bring this up to up to sort of uh, the, the the climax I want to give it for for today's purposes, which is uh, when COVID hit, uh, the this person Audrey Tang, who also happens, by the way, to be the world's first transgender minister, uh, led was one of the key figures leading the the Taiwanese COVID response, which they characterised by the three explicit design principles: fast, fun, and fair. Uh, and they effectively crowdsourced the national response. They, they set challenge prizes for people to create apps that would uh, track face mask availability in case outbreaks, all this sort of stuff. But they even set up a phone line, and this is the bit that I really love, and also the bit where even the people who've believed me so far start to stop believing that this is true. Uh, but it is. Uh, they set up a phone line where any citizen could ring in with ideas for how the country's response could be better. And a six-year-old boy rang up and said, the boys in my class don't want to wear their face masks because they're pink and they think that they're girly. Uh, so you need to do something to make pink face masks cool. And I think you should work with the baseball team, <laughs> which is a good voicemail message from a six-year-old. Like uh, but three days later, three days later, they had half the Taiwanese baseball team, the president and the little boy on the national televised press conference in their pink face masks. And, and like... And, the, this, by the way, like the story gets richer and richer. Like the, the, apparently, it set off a wave of pink is cool memes across the country. <laughs> they brought Pink Panther back onto primetime TV and all this sort of stuff. But the, the, the serious thing of this, and, and where I want to bridge into and, and like set out the framework of ideas, and then maybe we can talk a bit more about like what, what that might mean for this, is that the when you stop it, like that is obviously so far from what happened here. By the way, Taiwan, if you look into the figures, uh, arguably the world's most successful COVID response, the second lowest death rate after only New Zealand and never went into full lockdown. So uh, but they have this, they talked about participatory self-surveillance, like it's mad, uh, this, the, the story of this. But the, when you actually stop and think about it, like it's just a basic common sense principle. Like who knows better how little boys' brains work than another little boy? What we were talking on our table about the question of involvement, when you feel you have a meaningful say in a decision making process, when you feel you are actually listened to, like these are the, this is what it means to be involved. And, and the, the, the reason why, there's actually a, one, there's a lovely thing, I interviewed lots of people around this, and, and Audrey Tang in particular. And when I was interviewing Audrey, I said uh, at one point, uh, the people of Taiwan must really trust the government for you to be able to do this. And her answer was, the answer was a total flip. Uh, the, the response was, uh, we don't want people to trust government. What we want is, uh, and what we're devoting our kind of lives and work to, is government trusting people. Um, and I think that, that as a challenge to us in our institutions and in our working, that idea of like, the challenge isn't to earn trust from people, the challenge is to trust people, is a really powerful one. So the, the I will shut up in a minute and let you ask mm. another question. Um, but the, 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 the reason why I wrote the book and the, and the framework that I set out in the book is, is because I believe that we're living in a moment in time when uh, actually something very, very exciting and very powerful and very different is possible and is emerging in so many different places and probably in its fullest and most kind of uh, gloriously exciting form in that Taiwanese COVID response, nation of 23 million people but is also present in so many other ways and places. And, and the framework that I set out is, the, is, the, is I, I see the world through the lens of what I call stories. And I talk about three stories of the individual in society. The subject story, the consumer story, and the citizen story. And you can think of this the sort of simplest way to introduce it as a, is as a kind of historical shift over the last hundred years or so. Although it's, there is complexity behind that simplicity. But, but end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, people were something like subjects. The right thing to do was to keep your head down, do as you're told, get what you're given, on the basis that the God-given few who run society know best, and they'll lead us to the best outcomes of society as a whole. That sort of fell apart end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, rise of the middle class, industrial revolution, all of that stuff. Out of the two world wars, we more or less deliberately, more or less consciously kind of constructed an alternative story. So, we have done this sort of reconstruction of story before. We created a whole load of new institutions out of it. And that new story was the consumer story. And the consumer story said the right thing to do is to pursue self-interest, to choose the option that suits you best from those, from those that are offered, on the basis that self-interest will add up to collective interest. And the right thing for organisations and institutions to do is to, is to serve that self-interest and compete with one another to serve it better, 
on the basis that that will rise, the that, that will create a rising tide for everyone. So again, it is a thesis about how the best society results. And my argument is that just as the subject story collapsed before, under the weight of its own contradictions uh, and its sort of inherent at best paternalism, at worst authoritarianism, the consumer story is falling apart now because it, it, it is the source of the challenges of our time and you can't solve those challenges from within it. It's like you can't solve a crisis of loneliness and mental Ill health from within a story that says that people are independent, isolated individuals because it created that crisis. You can't solve a crisis of inequality from within a story that says that everything's a competition and we have to try and rise above one another because it created that crisis. And critically, and, and like where this work began for me and why I'm so excited to be back here, you can't solve an ecological crisis from within a story that says that a, that we're separate from nature, and B, that, uh, that happiness is the accumulation of material possessions, material standards of living, because that story created that crisis. And, and so that is why we are in this moment of, of widespread collapse, and so many symptoms, I think, can be tracked back to that. But I also think that, what's, that, that this much deeper, truer, more human story that has been present throughout human history and arguably predated the subject story and in indigenous wisdoms and cultures and so on and so forth, is rising again and now has the internet mm -hmm. uh, and says that actually the right thing to do isn't just to do as you're told nor to pursue self-interest, the right thing to do is to get involved, to contribute your ideas and energy and resources to the pursuit of the best outcomes for society as a whole and critically for organisations and leaders to reorient and redesign themselves to tap into that collective wisdom, collective intelligence, collective energy. But that is the, the and, and if we can do that, and, and I, then we then I think we can unleash something truly spectacular and we can face the challenges of our time. But if we try and solve them from within the existing paradigm, then, then we're screwed. Uh, and so the, what I try what I've tried to do a bit of what we the new citizenship project you asked me to that's sort of one more sense on that and then back to you. Um, the, the NCP uh, uh, quite apart from kind of undermining myself uh, by uh, spending 10 years working in the advertising industry and then founding an organisation with the same acronym as a car park, uh, <laughs> thereby belying all my right to be a, on the stage at a communications conference. Um, New Citizenship Project is essentially, it's sort of a consultancy business, but it's really been a research project. It, it, what we do is we, we, we help organisations, we try and help organisations see people as citizens rather than consumers and try and figure out what it would look like for them to inhabit that mode. Uh, and as I say, I, it's sort of a consultancy business, it's just got any, any decent consultancy business will tell you that, that the way to run a consultancy business is to do the same thing for lots of different people and make a stack load of cash out of it. And what we do is do lots of different things for lots of different people and earn absolutely nothing. Uh, so, so we're not really a consultancy business. But, but yes, yeah, so that's the, that framework of ideas, that diagnosis that we're in a moment where the whole kind of consumer paradigm is what is collapsing. And yet, and the opportunity is to step into this idea of people as citizens is what's going on for me. Mm, amazing. I've got a couple more questions, but I'd like, um, I mean, we're gonna throw the floor open for now as well. So if you're online, um, put your questions in the chat. Uh, Izzy here will pick them up. And if you're here in the room, please do put your hand up for a reflection, a thought, or anything. I mean, John, I guess one thing I did want to say was we had a conversation about a week ago, just kind of prepping. And I said, you know, a week is a long time in politics. So, and little did we know. So I don't have a question there, but I just, I'm going to put that out in the room that a lot's happened since we spoke last week. I mean, you're, you're talking about lots of, before we kind of come back to Together for Nature, lots of different organizations yeah. you're working with. And I'm hearing and seeing your work kind of pop up in lots of unexpected places. Where have you been surprised to Ooh. see it pop up? Who's, who's run you up out of the blue? I mean, all sorts of things. Like, and, and the joy of the, of the work at the moment is the variety. Like, I'm, I'm working, I was just telling some folks over here, I'm working with a... a uh, a guy called Baratunde Thurston in the in the United States, who is a comedian who uh, has sort of latched onto the same sort of set of ideas. Uh, has a podcast called How to Citizen, where he uses the word citizen as a verb. Uh, and we are working to try and like create a TV series that would tell the stories of uh, community power, community led 
uh, innovation all across America and kind of invite others to step into that story, which is pretty cool and <laughs> weird, and I didn't see that coming. Uh, and then just yesterday, I, my day, uh, I've been in Manchester for a few days, and, and, uh, uh, and, and just yesterday I did a, a, a Zoom uh, talk with a group of social workers from across the council, across councils of the Northeast, where this paradigm is emerging again. There's a thing, if you want to check it out, there's a thing called the, which is being called the Liberated Method. Uh, and it has a, a proven case where uh, what they did was they, they found, as a, as a sort of, as a test, as a proof of concept, they found this guy who had basically got very complex multiple needs, uh, had cost the state uh, two million pounds in the last year. And because he was being attended to by 15 different uh, social services, essentially. And they said, let's start from a relational basis where we see him not as a, as a user of services, but as a, as, a, as a citizen with a contribution to make that can be unleashed if we can find the right relationships and, and create the right uh, and, and help him find community. And uh, 100, 108,000 uh, pounds, 12 meetings later, the guy is now uh, pretty much flourishing in, 40, in, in under a year and uh, apparently yesterday chaired his first uh, uh, peer meeting for other people affected by complex needs in finding their agency. So and, and, through, and then I was in the evening, I was at Manchester University doing a thing on, on what, this, what this shift in paradigm means for universities. Uh, we like to maybe just to give you a little tool to play with. We, um, we, we like to play a game with the subject consumer citizen thing where you kind of hold up any given thing to, to those three lenses and say, what does this mean here? It's like in a, in a council, you're like, in the subject frame, a council is a local authority and the mayor has a chain that is like, it must be addressed as Mr. Mayor, uh, often Mr. Mayor. Uh, and, uh, and in a consumer story, the council becomes a service provider and, uh, and then uh, and drives efficient and effective delivery. And, in a, and then you ask the question, what might it be in a citizen story? And a, an enabler, a community enabler, a creator of conditions. And, and we, we uh, someone from the BBC over here, we, we played the game with the BBC. And we're like, the BBC was created in the subject story to inform, educate, and entertain brackets the proles, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of paternalistic enterprise in the consumer era really struggles because there are loads of models to create content for consumers. Like, put the BBC up against Netflix and Disney Plus and stuff, and you get some really bad decisions. What does the BBC look like in a citizen era? We had this sort of thought starter of like, what if it was the MBC, not the BBC, the movement for British mm. culture? So yeah, so I get to play with, uh, like at the moment, work with, work with, very seriously, not play, work, uh, <laughs> with all sorts of different aspects. And I, and, and, but really what I'm passionate about is offering this, and the reason why I wrote the book, like being briefly serious and stepping out of my uh, kind of inner Labrador mode, uh, that the, the, the reason why I wrote the book was because it felt so, really, it felt so heavy to be able to sort of see this, but not be able to get it out of my head and offer it. So, mm. the, so the book and, and the work is intended to sort of go, this might be useful. You might want to, you might want to play it this way. And the reason I ask about these other places, I think, it, you know, for us in the environmental space, it's always useful to just hear where, where else might we look other than, you know, to each other in this room for models and ideas. Um, another question for me, I will say whoever's brave enough to ask the first question gets to go first in the lunch queue. Um, together for nature as our theme. And you heard my story about, you know, the question yeah, yeah. mark, the exclamation mark. I mean, which of those kind of resonates for you? Can you relate to that? Which one would yeah, you have chosen? Totally. I mean, I, I guess, uh, well, let me, maybe I'll, before we see where people want to take the conversation, maybe there's a, I'll set out like a couple of things that I think this way of thinking might mean for this space mm -hmm. specifically, and uh, which lends itself more to the sort of question mark, I guess. Um, and, and I'll give you sort of, maybe what I'd offer you is, is three things to notice that I think the, con the fact that we are still work living and working from within the consumer story, even though we all know it's broken, three ways I think that is showing up in this sector and three things that I think it pushes you to do that, that we, could, we need to avoid doing and we need to sort of challenge. The first, uh, the first is the idea that the organisations, particularly the NGOs in this sector, should think of themselves as competitors with one another rather than 
pursuers of a bigger cause and, and, the, and the dynamics of competing for members and competing for donations and all of that stuff are super destructive. Um, I was involved in the making of a film called Project Wild Thing, which some of you may have, may have seen a good few years ago now, but the, the, the maker of the film, we got him, I think, to speak at a communicate conference. Yeah. <laughs> and David's challenge to the audience, I think, is still is evergreen. His challenge was, you are not marketing directors or communicators uh, for your organisations. You are the collective communications directors of nature. And, and how do you do that together? Uh, I was talking before to someone from the Wildlife Trust, and I think their model of distributed and look, bouncing off each other and sort of sibling, that's a really powerful one. So know, but, but my point is know that what the, the systems and incentives and structures that have been sort of shaped our society for the last 80 years or so, but no longer, encourage you to see each other as competition rather than collaborators. And, and notice that and, and know that you will have to work quite hard to transcend that, mm. I think is number one. Number two is, is uh, I think, uh, the, the next thing that it makes you do is it, it, it encourages you to have a hero complex. Uh, and this, I think, is the most dangerous thing, uh, actually, in this moment in time. I'm, I sometimes say I'm more worried about the, the people who, of all goodwill, think that they're, they're trying to save us than I am about the people who are, who are trying to destroy everything. I'm almost, like, I'm not fully serious, but I'm almost more worried by the dynamics of Biden than I am of Trump, for example. Because... Because what, the, what too many of people in positions of power, the way they see this moment is they only see the consumer story and the subject story. So they think that their role is to defend what we have from the lapse into authoritarianism, into, into, that, into that sort of darkness. And the result of that is that they, they don't open up and involve people. And I think that's true in this sector. I'm, I'm quite concerned at the moment by, uh, and I'll say, after the next one I'll say more about why, by the kind of the, the way that the, the instinct to sort of campaign and communicate in ways that say, uh, that say get behind us and we will challenge government uh, is, a, is, a, is a reflex in times of a, a, when elections are looming and this kind of thing, because that's not what is going to build power. The, the power is built through coming in behind what people in communities are already doing. And, and just so to bridge into that, my last one. So, so firstly, notice that the system is trying to make you compete, not collaborate. Secondly, notice that the system is trying to, the dynamics of the system are trying to make you have a hero complex and not and, and do it for people rather than come in behind people. And thirdly, notice that the dynamics of the system make you look, and this comes to your week as a long time in politics, mm -hmm. make you look at government, mm -hmm. particularly central government. And that is not where it's going to come from. The revolution, like, the, it just, it, I mean, even if there's a, there's a, there's a better government, and, and for all I, I hope that there, that there is, uh, and that's not a party political point, it's just, at many levels, it's just a competency point. But the, even if there is a better government, that is still not where our primary attention should be, I think. And that takes me back to the, the Taiwan stuff, and, and, and my, one of my favourite kind of, quotes and sort of summaries of philosophy is, is the Buckminster Fuller, the, the mid-century American designer and thinker, had this thing where he said, you never, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, you create a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. You create the space for things to move into rather than uh, campaigning against or, or, or attacking the system on its own terms because all that does is increase its power, actually. There's a wonderful guy, Niger I'm quoting too many people, but a Nigerian philosopher called Bayar Komalafe, who some of you may have come across if you haven't looked up his stuff. But he, he talks about the idea that like, it's, it, it's in it, what we pay attention to grows. Uh, and, but, and precisely by pouring all of our attention and energy towards Whitehall and central government and so forth, we are actually endorsing the idea that that is where the power to decide our destiny lies. And so, and just to give you, so I, uh, I suspect a fair few of you in this room will have come across a, a campaign over the last year called the People's Plan for Nature. Uh, just give me a little like, is that, have people seen this? Yeah. So I, I was, we as the Citizenship Project kind of conceived and designed a lot of the, the underlying process of that. And actually, uh, and, and I know there's a session in tomorrow's conference, so we won't go into loads of detail unless people want to, but the... The, the idea of that was really to bring all these three insights together and say, like, 
this is a time when it, th this is a way of working that starts with finding and celebrating what people are already doing for their local nature and communities around the country, sees that as an input to a process that says that whereby the big organisations come together and collaborate to hold space for people to identify what they want to happen. And, and then not to campaign at government or, or to endorse the idea that they have the power, but to, to build, the, build the democratic legitimacy of something that is truly people-driven, to say that there needs to be a new model by which we make these decisions and we're going to invest in this and build the legitimacy of it and challenge government to step into it in much the same way as GovZero in Taiwan challenged government to step into their way of working rather than we are going to challenge, like we're going to say, and I don't mean to pick on a particular organisation, but just for sake of illustration, like nature can't wait or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. nature, like that's not the point. People aren't waiting is more the point. Mm -hmm. There are community energy schemes and community nature schemes. Blah, blah, blah. Let's platform those and celebrate them and build and connect them up and build the power in them and, and, and make change inevitable rather than ask for change or demand change. Yeah. Amazing. I think we've got um, a comment from our online. Obviously, we can't put this person in front of the lunch queue, so we're going to send you your question. We're going to send you a copy of John's book. Hey, there you go. Um, so, <laughs> first question. So, yeah, we have a few questions from online. We've only got five more minutes, but oh. I'll just pick a few. So, Tay asks, how can we build people's capacity for imagination so that they can understand their role and feel empowered and excited to take action in their own way? So that's imagination. Do you want to riff a couple more questions and then we can see, or maybe take some from the room? If we've only got five minutes, I'll just yeah, wonder yeah, how you absolutely. want to play. I'll, I'll say one more from online, which is that was imagination. Yeah. And the second one is about young people and voting. There is evidence of increased activism through social media, but why doesn't this translate to more people voting? Because the government is still where the majority of power resides. And how do you think we can get more young people to vote? Okay, a couple of great ones there. Would anyone else like to chip in here on the floor? When we come to the formal end of the conversation, we will have a bit of a break for the next session for some more informal conversation. But would anyone like to chip in here in the room? I mean, lunch queue people, like, what's going on? <laughs> okay. so I can riff a little bit. So, uh, uh, I mean, if you're interested in imagination, like, look up a woman called Phoebe Tickell uh, and her work on the, on the concept of imagination activism uh, the, the, and, and imagination justice, which is a language I really love. Mm. Uh, like, who get, she's really interested in the question of who gets to imagine the future. Uh, and why is it basically only white people who look like me that live in Silicon Valley? Um, and, and how do we spread that? She's done a really fascinating project with Camden Council, uh, where they have trained a cohort of the staff from across the council as imagination activists. And, that, and they're now training on wider groups of people. And that work is looking like spreading across the kind of local government world uh, for the 1% who are, mm -hmm. who are in the room from that world. Uh, the, the, the thing at the core of that is the idea, much like my work on citizenship, which, which is rooted in the idea that citizenship is a muscle you build, not a cup you empty. Like Phoebe talks about the idea that imagination is a muscle you build as well and, and that needs exercise. So, uh, yeah, and just to say, like that work, whenever you do anything participatory democracy vibes, uh, or anything participatory, basically, people always turn it to use for the sake of nature and climate. And my theory on this is that, uh, you know, the, the, the data that always says that like 80% of people care about climate and nature, but only 20% are doing everything. And that makes us all go, oh, how do we get people to act on what they, what they believe in? And we need to make it easy. And I'm like, no, the, the reason why people aren't acting is, and this sort of bridges to the young people and voting thing, is because they feel that those actions are not commensurate with the scale of the challenge. The things we're asking people to do are not commensurate with the scale of the challenge, and the things we're asking, people, and they're right. Like this is the like people are smart, and the point of this work, the point of the imagination work that Phoebe does, and and all the work I do is like true agency is always collective, not individual, right? Like, and and so this isn't about 
like, for all that it's good to make the individual behaviour changes, and please don't get me wrong and say I'm, I don't think those things are important, the, the real thing is when, is when we create the opportunities for people to come together or, or when we come in behind where people are already coming together. What's been fascinating in Camden, and like I say, whenever you create that kind of opportunity, you see people using it for the sake of nature and, and, and on climate because they suddenly feel like they have agency commensurate with the challenge. So in climate, there's a, this initiative called Communitrees where uh, actually the, the Camden like city gardeners have created their own kind of volunteer cohort through this imagination work and are now not only planting but sustaining the trees in the, that they've planted in Camden. So, and, but even in, in Paris where there's one of the most exciting uh, and ambitious participatory democracy experiments, Paris now has a standing citizens' assembly so 100 randomly selected Parisians who are now effectively like the, upper, like the House of Lords, but for the city of Paris. And they decide the theme for 100 million, Euro, 100 million euros a year of participatory budgeting. And they've done that for the last two years, I think. And both years they've decided it's nature and climate. Mm. Because when you give people that... So, so this thing about like creating the space for people. So the question about voting... So, and so this, this is this tension. Like I do think, obviously I believe that... that that these things are important. And I think, but I think what you, the, the vo voting in and of itself is, is a consumer, like what we, have, what we have today is what I would call a consumer democracy, where people are, the people's agency is limited to choosing between a fixed set of options and where we're encouraged to make that choice on the basis of individual self-interest. And that is not commensurate with the scale of the challenge. And that, I believe, is why a lot of, Young people are tuning out of that. The, when things come to the crunch uh, at, at sort of election time, we will need to mobilise and do that work. Uh, and and the, looking at what happened in Poland in the last election, there was a surge of, of energy and interest from young people who were like, we, this, this will be a line that we have to make sure is not crossed. Uh, and, but, but we have to understand that that is all it is. To them, and, the, and, and I, in my view, they're right. Mm -hmm. Like the the voting in the next in the next election will only ever be a, 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 enough to draw a line that says we will go no further in the wrong direction. What it isn't is commensurate to take us in a right direction, and and we have to not see voting as the extent of this. Like Baraton Day in the states, his podcast, they explicitly saying like that citizening is not equivalent to voting. And we have to get beyond that idea. And we have to not let all of our energy for the next, oh, geez, I'm so worried mm -hmm. for this movement, this work, that for the next 12 months, all of our energy is going to be in relation to Whitehall. Like, because we, we're, we're going to let everyone down if we do that. So, yeah. I think we're going to finish on that challenge to set up our day. We've got a day to really talk to each other. Um, and, and thank you so much to our online delegates for chipping in as well. I can't wait to get online and see the conversation that's going on. Does this mean um, I get to be first in the lunch? It meeting, does. So. <laughs> it does. Um, a huge thank you to John for um, coming down, for kicking off our day, for giving us absolutely loads to think about. Um, as I said, we've now got a kind of um, short break. Our next session starts at 11, so a chance to kind of pick up the conversations with those on the table. I know that you need to go, but people might grab you out the door as you go. Um, thank you for a great start to the day. See you back here at 11.